My name is Mark Rulo. Uh, I served in the Canadian Armed Forces for 24 years. Uh, I retired in 2005 as a full colonel in the Public Affairs Branch. Uh, I'm a military college grad. I began my military career as a combat arms officer uh, before moving over to Public Affairs uh, and then served the remainder of my career as a Public Affairs officer. I retired prematurely for medical reasons but uh, uh, enjoyed every minute of my, uh, of my career. So it's the summer of 1993. I'm uh, into my third year into the branch. I'm a captain uh, and I'm deploying as the uh, public affairs officer for CC Unperfor, so the Canadian contingent in the former Yugoslavia. We've got three battalion groups in three different locations, uh, as well as a headquarters and a fourth location. We're spread over two different countries and we're dealing with uh, conflict between three belligerents. Uh, on the third day of being in theater, we have a flash deployment to uh, uh, the southern uh, region of Croatia, uh, a, an operation that has just sprung up and while it's not part of the uh, CANBAT areas of responsibility, uh, the decisions made that uh, they want Canadian elements as part of this uh, high visibility uh, operations. So I spent about three weeks uh, in southern Croatia, finally the operation doesn't come to pass as with many things in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, what was planned uh, doesn't end up occurring and uh, we end up moving back north. Uh, the second week of September, uh, the Croat forces in southern Croatia uh, make an incursion into an area of the Krajina. The Krajina was technically part of the new uh, Croatian nation, uh, but densely populated for generations by, uh, by S Serbian ethnic Serbs. Uh, and so uh, an incursion by Croatian forces who want to assert their a dominance all, uh, over all of their territorial uh, boundaries and, uh, and want to send a strong message to uh, Serbia that the Krajina will, uh, will be firmly in Croat hands. So an incursion uh, that captures this small area, about 20 square kilometers, that had 11 villages and hamlets uh, in it, uh, and the major village was the village of Medak. So it became known as the Medak Pocket. Croatian forces, Croat forces, were those of the uh, Republic of Hrvatska, which is what we know as Croatia today. Uh, the Serb forces in the Krajina, again, were ethnic Serbs, and they were reinforced by uh, Serb paramilitary forces from Serbia, uh, including around the Belgrade area. Uh, and they, uh, there was also reinforcement by uh, Bosnian uh, forces as well. So some Bosnian Serbs into the Krajina, as well as some Bosnian uh, forces loyal to the Croatians, uh, who were uh, working with the, with the Croatian uh, paramilitary. So uh, a toxic mix and a complicated mix. And one of the first things we discovered when we were on the ground was uh, just trying to get a handle on who was who and who was aligned with who was more complicated than we had seen in previous uh, Canadian Forces operations. The incursion occurs on the 9th and 10th of, uh, of September. Uh, and the decision is made once again, much like with the operation the month before, where Canbat 1 was deployed from northern Croatia, where it was based and where it had its area of responsibility. Uh, it's deployed precipitously to the southern region to uh, respond to this, uh, this, Croat, this Croatian force incursion. Uh, so uh, I deploy with the uh, battalion group and as luck would have it, the fact that we went through pretty much the same process a month before when I was brand new on the ground, it had allowed me to get to know the unit, uh, to uh, establish some credibility uh, with the key players and to really understand how uh, two PPCLI battalion group functioned. Uh, so that kind of dry run, not that we knew it at the time, but the dry, that dry run ended up being very useful for what would become the, uh, the MEDAC pocket operation. So deploy with two PPCLI, a uh, fairly difficult journey to get there because of the various checkpoints. We were crossing over from Cro Croatian controlled zones to Serb controlled zones, including the infamous Karlovac crossing, which was notorious for causing long delays and, uh, and was often a flashpoint from, uh, in terms of violence. Um, so uh, a difficult journey to get to where we're going, uh, but we finally deploy in the Medak pocket region, so we're offset in a, a, a city called uh, Gospic, uh, waiting for news. We know that there are negotiations underway between senior Serb and uh, Croatian uh, authorities that the UN is brokering. Uh, still no decision in terms of what the uh, ceasefire might look like, 
but we have a sense that we we're going to be playing a key role if, in fact, a ceasefire was mediated. So it comes to pass that uh, uh, in and around the 12th of September, the ceasefire is agreed upon by all parties. And essentially what is agreed upon is that the Serbs will remain at the line that they were pushed back at uh, as, as a result of the Croatian incursion. The Croat forces will pull back to their original uh, forward edge of the battle area and the UN will then occupy that area in between. So the UNs will become the custodians of the, uh, the stewards of the uh, Medak pocket area. And uh, all parties at senior levels agree to that arrangement. So three phased operation. Day one, we are to occupy the Serb lines. Uh, day two, we are to take over the space in between the Serb and Croat lines. So the existing no man's land where there were no forces because it was the active space between the two parties. And on the third day, we're to take the Croat lines with the Croatian forces then pulling back to their original position prior to the incursion into the Medak pocket. So that's, that's the theory and that's the plan that the battalion group puts in play um, and executes as of the 13th of September. So we go in on day one on the 13th of September and take over the Serb lines. No, no major friction there. The Serb forces on the ground are expecting us. They cede to our arrival. Again, they're not moving anywhere because they're maintaining the lines that they were pushed back to. Uh, but they, uh, they take us in without any, any issues. However, uh, we do take almost from the outset significant fire from the Croat side. So ostensibly the narrative would become that they were uh, firing at Serb forces who were firing first at them and that we just kind of got in the way because we were integrating the Serb position. Uh, but it's clear to uh, us that uh, that the Croats are perhaps not thrilled with the arrangement on the ground uh, and are uh, manifesting their displeasure. So that's day one. Day two unfolds quite similar to day one in terms of us moving into that space, uh, that buffer space in between the two, uh, two forward edges. Uh, we continue to take intensive fire and it's all from the same direction. So the Croats uh, are clearly targeting Canadian elements because we're no longer co-located with the Serbs by this point. We've moved forward of them and yet we're still uh, under significant fire uh, to the point where uh, the planning was completely uh, revamped to reflect the fact that this was that this operation was likely to happen completely under fire. On day three, so the 15th of September, uh, we're moving to the Croat lines. Uh, there's a strong sense within the battalion group that this is kind of going to be the pivotal uh, moment because it's clear that regardless of what their masters at higher levels have negotiated in terms of a ceasefire and an acceptable arrangement to all parties, it's clear that the Croatian forces on the ground are not pleased about having to push back and perhaps don't agree with uh, having to push back. And let's not forget that in the initial incursion in the second week of September, they had lost significant forces in making the push and capturing the Medak pocket. So that was obviously very uh, clear uh, to them and, and the notion of them unilaterally stepping back to let Canadian forces fill the void was, uh, was, was clearly not a welcome one. As it happened, so I'm, I'm in the middle of this, of this column uh, in our vehicle. We were mobile, we were armed and mobile uh, throughout the operation, which was critical. And I'll get to some of the elements that maybe uh, led to uh, our being effective um, a little later on. Uh, but we're halfway through the column and as it was, there were no media in the area when we arrived. Now, I remember the, the battalion commander at one point, as I arrived, as I married up with the battalion in, uh, in the pre-position, he, he whipped out of the command post at one point, saw me and said, find me CNN. You know, it was, it was right out of a movie. Now, in today's environment, that would make a lot more sense, but we're talking about 1993, and we're talking about an environment where Bosnia was very much the highlight and anything that was happening in Croatia was seen very much as backwater. There were no international journalists deployed in theater and there was very little interest in what was happening in Croatia. The, 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 the trigger was, was Bosnia, clearly. As it happens, there was a Reuters crew that had stumbled upon us the day before. So on day two of the operation, they showed up unannounced in theater. It was uh, stringers out of Belgrade. Uh, which would cause problems uh, within a 48 hour period, but they were there uh, representing Reuters. Uh, and so we were very pleased to see them. 
And right away, uh, we embedded them within the battalion. Now, this is in the days before embedding was a, uh, a term that, uh, that has taken on some significance, but we integrated them into the battalion. So they, they, they were with me uh, 24 and 7. They followed me. They had the same access I had. Uh, and, uh, and it was clear that they were there to capture what was going to happen with this operation. So I speak to the OPSO and I remind him of the fact that we've got an international news crew uh, who, uh, that is co-located with us and that uh, maybe we might want to consider moving them forward to be able to capture the toing and froing that's going on between the Croatian commander and, our, uh, and the battalion CO. Uh, and one of the things that the battalion CO was very clear on was all of the structure around the ceasefire agreement. So we actually had the documentation signed by all the parties at senior levels. Uh, so we felt we were on very solid ground in terms of getting access to their lines and having them push back. So uh, the idea is discussed with the CO and it's decided that we're going to bring them forward. So a stalemate that had been going on without any progress for a number of hours. Uh, all of a sudden we've got this Reuters crew that are filming the unit CO demanding that the Croatian commander respect the terms of this agreed upon uh, official um, arrangement uh, and, and cede his front line to UN forces uh, as the new custodians of the area and push back to the former. Uh, and it's, it's, it's rock solid in terms of the documentation. It's clear uh, that he has the upper hand. Within 15 minutes of Reuters uh, filming this exchange, uh, the Croat commander cedes, uh, orders his forces to pull back, and grudgingly they give way, and we take over the, uh, the third portion of the, of, the, uh, of the area of operation as per, as per the ceasefire agreement. In, in a strong way, uh, the employment of media uh, in the area of operation was very much a tactical and an operational force multiplier for us. Uh, the question of how long it would have taken it for us to get through had we just continued the same approach that we were using before we brought the Reuters crew forward uh, is debatable, but uh, things were going nowhere fast. Now, once we took over the Croat lines, uh, again, they pushed back very grudgingly and there were a lot of friction points and uh, aimed weapons and uh, warning shots uh, from both sides and it was a very tense situation. They ceded the ground that they had won very reluctantly. At one point in the process of that happening, it, uh, it came known by the Croatian forces that the Reuters crew was in fact, uh, were stringers out of Belgrade, so they were Serbs. And uh, at that point, when that became clear, it was obvious that we had to get them out of the area of operations uh, immediately. And so we quickly uh, uh, we packaged them up in, uh, in one of our vehicles. In fact, they weren't riding in my vehicle anymore. We put them in one of the M113s because of the heightened threat and brought them back to Gospic and they went on their, uh, their merry way. On day two of the operation, so the, the period where we're moving from the Serb lines into that space in between the Croatian and Serb lines, we started to see uh, about a dozen plumes of smoke rising from behind the Croat front edge. And it became clear to us in a hurry that we were witnessing ethnic cleansing, that the Croatians understanding that they would eventually be required to cede the ground that they had won would ensure that it would never be have, have, uh, that it could never be uh, lived in again by um, any of the other cultures. So they systemically destroyed uh, the villages and hamlets that were within the Medak pocket as they withdrew, and we were powerless to do anything about it because uh, because of the schedule, the timetable of the arrangement. And for us to have pushed it forward would have caused significant. Uh, uh, diplomatic uh, and military repercussions. So our only hope was that because the pocket had uh, had been taken earlier that most of the population had fled uh, in advance of that or as that un unfolded so that what we were seeing was hopefully uh, more about material destruction than it was about uh, about the ethnic cleansing of, 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 of actual uh, members of the population. So we take over the Croat positions and what we had feared we see in Technicolor. So fire is raging everywhere, just about every dwelling on fire or destroyed. 
uh, the use of explosive devices, mines and grenades uh, to accelerate the destruction of a lot of these, uh, uh, these dwellings. We saw things like that, that that were very difficult to process, especially uh, when it was our first experience with ethnic cleansing. The other significant part was that this was the first time that Croatian forces had been caught red-handed in terms of ethnic cleansing, which would have uh, serious repercussions from a war crimes tribunal perspective in the years which followed. On a deployment like that, uh, there were a ton of firsts, and uh, one of the firsts was a way in which myself and my imagery tech were employed, which we could have never have dreamed of before our deployment. And that was because of this emphasis on war crimes, we had RCMP elements who were attached to the battalion group, uh, as well as uh, other CIVPOL members. And none of them had the ability to visually capture uh, incidents of suspected ethnic cleansing. So this quick and ready solution was every time we found uh, uh, people who had been killed under what seemed like uh, uh, suspicious uh, circumstances, especially civilians, including the elderly and the very, very young. Uh, uh, I was called out with my imagery tech to capture on video and still photography uh, the scene before it was, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, taken care of and, uh, and the, the, the people involved uh, properly uh, disposed. That was a very harrowing uh, experience because uh, we were put in situations where we were literally uh, nose to nose with folks who had been uh, killed in some of the most atrocious ways. The one, uh, there's one that will always stick out in my mind and I've spoken at length to my imagery tech, Sergeant uh, Mike Bonin, um, uh, about this particular situation. It was in a chicken coop. so. Uh, the chicken coop was not lit, obviously, and, and it was very low, so the, 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 the ceiling was very low. So you had to crouch uh, almost on all fours to get in to, uh, to have access to it. And there was two females, uh, one uh, in her, I would say, 40s or 50s, although often difficult to tell age from a population that has a very rural, very rudimentary lifestyle, but uh, probably in her 40s or 50s, and uh, another female who looked very much like her, probably in her late teens, early 20s. So we had a strong sense that it was probably mother and daughter. They were both laid side by side, uh, and they were tied together, and uh, their, the chicken coop and their bodies had been set on fire. Uh, and for whatever reason, the fire had extinguished at some point, and so they were burnt to the point of being completely uh, uh, not discernible from the waist down, and yet from the waist up, they were almost uh, the, physically they were almost completely intact, a little bit rubbery from the effects of the smoke and the heat, uh, but otherwise uh, very normal. So you had this, and for us to get in to film it and to photograph it, we were literally right on top of it. And it was a very harrowing scene, one that I've never been able to forget, and one that really drove home the fact that we were in a new environment, a new conflict environment, one that didn't have maybe a lot of the rules of previous conflict environments, and one where public affairs, for want uh, or for better, was going to be playing some diverse roles, including, including this one. So uh, it, it was a real eye-opener. Uh, I put together a news release on day one, so on the 13th, when we effected uh, phase one of the operation, to outline what was happening on the ground and what the intent was. I cleared by the unit CO who was pleased with, uh, with the content. Again, back then, unable for me in the deep uh, wild west of southern Croatia to be able to uh, disseminate that myself uh, on any sort of macro level. And so I worked through DGPA in Ottawa, sent the release to them, and then they distributed it outward. So that was uh, the, first, uh, the first action. Uh, we followed that up with uh, direct uh, communication with Canadian, major Canadian media in Canada. So I had negotiated with the OPSO uh, dedicated use of the satellite phone, which was our only way to speak directly to uh, Canadian or other media who weren't in theatre. So I negotiated two one-hour windows in each 24-hour cycle, which given the fact that there was only one sat phone for the battalion in the midst of a high-intensity operation was quite a significant uh, a chunk. 
and uh, and we worked the hours so that it would fit with media uh, information cycles, which again back in '93 were quite different than those of today. Uh, so uh, as the operation unfolded, I was actually reaching out directly to uh, CBC, CTV, Global, Radio Canada, TVA, all of the major players again back then in '93 to say, uh, this is what's happening with Canadian forces deployed in southern Croatia, major operation, uh, significant intensity, kind of mapping out what was happening. And again, to our frustration, we were getting, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Now, one of the things that hurt us was the fact that we hadn't had, up to that point, a fatality in the operation. And as grim as that may sound, the fact that there was something happening in Croatia that didn't involve uh, deceased Canadian soldiers meant that it wasn't deemed on this end as being very news. But I was literally on the phone for two hours of every day soliciting media directly, providing them opportunity to speak to our soldiers who were involved in the operation. The CO was amenable to speaking to Canadian media and the pickup was next to nil. Uh, so that was, uh, that was uh, disconcerting. From an imagery perspective, obviously that would have unlocked uh, the lack of interest from a Canadian perspective. Our challenge was that the imagery that we took, we could not get it out unless we went to a major center, the closest being Zagreb, which was probably about a five hour drive, but given the, the checkpoints and all of that could take between uh, 12 and 24 hours to, to make that. So we were light on the ground. I couldn't afford to dispatch my team, one of my team of two, uh, to do that in the midst of the operation, still not knowing what was still to come with the operation. So uh, that was tricky. We got the images out after MEDAC through Zagreb, uh, but by then the story was done and there was no more interest in it than when we were communicating it verbally as, uh, as the operation was unfolding. Um, ironically, there's this sense that uh, Canada never really found out about MEDAC until well after the fact. Ironically, it was quite highly publicized in Europe because the Reuters crew, when they left our uh, mission area, they went back to uh, Belgrade uh, and the visuals and the content went out and it played fairly substantively in, uh, in continental Europe and in the UK. And uh, for many of those audiences, they knew full well what Canadians had done at MEDAC. Uh, the irony is that we weren't able to get that same kind of pickup uh, with the Canadian audience. Again, there were technical impediments, but uh, the impediments went simply beyond the technical. So in the intervening years, there's been that notion that there was perhaps a post-Somalia, a bit of a conspiracy uh, theory in terms of wanting to silence the uh, intensity of uh, MEDAC. Uh, we would have never integrated an international news television crew with our battalion group when the opportunity arose, had we had any intent to stifle uh, or limit the flow of information out. The Reuters crew had full access to the area that we had and, uh, and made uh, full use of it. So why did the information not get out? As I said, uh, th there were technolo technological uh, impediments that simply won't exist uh, today. But more than that, when we went into the operation, while we had a sense that it would be hot, that it would be uh, violent, that it would be difficult. We had no clue how difficult it would actually be until we're right in the thick of it. And once we're right in the thick of it, yes, we were communicating that, but also uh, investing almost all of our energy in terms of completing the mission and keeping our people alive. And so it was easy once the operation was over to say, oh my God, that was, that was crazy. We had a sense of that as it was unfolding, but we didn't know that before. And we didn't have a really clear picture of that until after it was over. So. You know, nobody gave us a warning order saying this is going to be, you know, the most intensive operation for the Canadian forces since Korea. You know, we didn't know that going in. I came away from my tour in the former Yugoslavia and MEDAC in particular with a couple of takeaways. The first was a recognition that uh, the employment of media on the battlefield and the ability to influence or shape perception around a military operation uh, was now absolutely fundamental to uh, Canadian Forces operations uh, of the future. Up until MEDAC, all of the operations that I had been involved in as, as, a, as an operator, uh, we had had strict control over the, the battle space. So we decided what journalists would come in theatre, where they would go, when they would go, when they would leave, who they'd be with, who they'd speak to. 
when I got to the former Yugoslavia, Croatia and Bosnia, it was clear that the media was there whether we wanted them to be there or not, and specifically Bosnia where you couldn't throw a stone without uh, hitting a journalist. Uh, it was uh, clear that the f old rules of being able to dictate what the media saw, when they saw it, and how they saw it, uh, no longer existed. Uh, so uh, it, it, it marked me that uh, we were in a much more fluid environment and that being able to influence and manage the, the, the media in theatre uh, would be fundamental to uh, future Canadian Force operations. And that's a lesson that I, I carried over with me for the rest of my career and which uh, served me very well. It was also clear that uh, for a deployment like that, the ability to integrate within the frontline unit and to be recognized as a credible value-added member of that unit was, uh, was critical. Yes, not every member in the battalion knew why the heck a public affairs officer was and an imagery tech was in their midst, uh, but the people that needed to understand it understood it and accepted it. And in fact, as uh, I recounted earlier, we're able to leverage it in a key situation. And I think that's fundamental. You can't do this business from the back end. We did suffer casualties. There were a number of uh, members uh, wounded in action. We suffered one uh, deceased member. It was actually a vehicle accident uh, on MEDAC plus two. So uh, after the operation had uh, the th critical three days of the operation had unfolded. Uh, we lost uh, one of our officers uh, on a head-on collision. There was always some suspicion that perhaps that was not a, a complete accident, uh, but that was never proven. But uh, by and large, given the volume of fire uh, involved with MEDAC and the intensity of the, uh, of the operation, uh, the fact that w we came out with, uh, with such small numbers of of wounded was uh, was quite significant. There were charges on the other side that the Croatians had, uh, that the Canadians had inflicted uh, 25 to 30 Croatian killed in action. Never proven. Do I doubt that number? Not necessarily because as I say it was it was uh, hell unleashed uh, during key periods of that three-day window uh, but uh, no way to verify that. But I do know that the Canadian uh, soldiers in my midst were nothing but professional and the admiration that I had for the Canadian fighting uh, soldier uh, before MADAC was only amplified after.